Welcome. This is the last and um, uh, program of the season. And Debbie has been talking about this program for weeks now. And we're so excited to have you, John, here with us. Um, it's, it's thrilling to have um, a new perspective on music. And uh, we welcome you. Thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to welcome John, and I can't wait to hear your music, John. So I'm going to send it back to Debbie. So thank you very much, Susan. Um, so I asked John to speak and for us to hear his music because I once went to a music in the round of three folk singers, and it was at Anderson Fair. And what I noticed is that with the other two folk singers, when they wanted to sing about something different, Basically, I heard the same music with the same one, four, five chords, kind of relatively simple chord structure. Uh, they would sing repeated stanzas, and if they wanted to sing about something different, they would just change the words on top of that. But they looked at John as a cut above, because when John sang, the entire song changed. The, um, the genre of the music was appropriate for what he was singing. Often you would hear individual word painting, and I, this reminded me of some of the great art song composers, Schubert and Schumann. The other thing about John, and he'll tell you a little bit about his background, is that he is a, a literature student. He majored in literature and taught literature. So you hear a little bit more sophistication in his lyrics. And the other thing that makes him similar to the art song composers is he sings about these great human themes, which I think everybody can put themselves in, their, in the place of the protagonist in his songs. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce John William Davis. Thanks, John. Well, thank you, Debbie. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm just plain old John or John William, if you met me after about 2003 or four. That happened when I started going out and playing a little bit. And one day Google my name, John Davis Musician, and I got a bunch of them. Uh, this one of the curses of a real normal name. So that's when I added the middle name. And plus I was going to play in Texas and I feel like in Texas, you really need a middle name if you're gonna be a songwriter. Um, as far as coming to music, it was a really strange in my case because uh, I uh, really had no interest in it until my sister had gone off to college and she and I both like soul music. I She really liked Motown and I really liked everything recorded on stacks. Anyway, um, she had gone off to college and a guy really wanted to impress her with uh, his um, good musical taste and gave her a copy of Rubber Soul, which she hated and left on the stereo. And I fell in love with that old Beatles album and decided I really want to learn how to get play something. Uh, because uh, among other things, I was terminally shy and um, wanted maybe to get a girlfriend. Thought that might be a way to do it. Anyway, I played a lot of rock and roll and stuff up until I was about 30. And in guitar, a lot of times if you're an electric guitarist, you're just mostly focused on, <laughs> in those days, pentatonic scales and, uh, you know, blues rock and and things like that, which is all well and fine. But uh, when I was about 31, my mother got terminal cancer and I quit the band I was playing with out west to go home and be with her. And she asked me to go back to school because uh, nobody in my family really had ever taken a degree. And I went back to school and didn't know what I was going to do and decided I'd take an English class and kind of fell in love with that. And for the next 11 or 12 years, I didn't play any music at all and uh, just studied language and, and taught a little bit. When I did start playing again, I decided to play acoustic guitar because I thought maybe you could do that all by yourself and instead of being in a band, which is, uh, I'm sure my friend Jack could tell you, oftentimes like being in a dysfunctional family. Um, and I, uh, started trying to learn the acoustic guitar, but I mainly listened to piano players. And the two I mostly listened to were um, Dr. John, somebody I always really loved, and Randy Newman. And that took me to um, 
to try and write songs. When um, Debbie talked about what she wanted to try to talk about with my music, she reminded me of a term I got in a music appreciation class, which I think I made a C in when I was about 19. I wasn't very good. Uh, the three things I remember were the professor, he had a, a little bow tie he always wore and it was a little bit prissy. And uh, I thought we took him John McLaughlin, but one of my old music friends reminded me, no, we took him Weather Report, if you know who that is heavy weather to listen to and he thought it was just nonsense and noise and um, said the only thing worth listening to was Neil Diamond and I realized we were on different planets. Um, the other thing I remember about that class is that I was no good at uh, this little, when we take test, he just put the needle down in the middle of the symphony somewhere and I never could tell you if it was Brahms or Beethoven. I was deaf as a post. But toward the end of the course, we got into the Impressionists. And that was the first time it really struck home for me. And I think it was Debussy. And he was playing La Mer. And I could hear the sea. I could smell the sea. I, could, I wanted sushi. Um, it was just wonderful. And the term he used was mimetic, mimetic music. Well, uh, you know, like a mime where you tell a story, but you don't use any sound. Um, you do it all with gesture. Well, the my you, you're you're trying to imitate something in life. Well, I guess from his perspective anyway, the impressionists were going out and trying to imitate things in nature with sound and I just thought that was the most wonderful idea and I guess it always stuck with me. Um, and in songwriting, he says you're trying to write lyrics too. There was this golden age when you used to have the musician writing the music and the lyricist writing the lyrics, but I guess it got too expensive so they really depended on on those of us who wanted to to, to handle both parts and there were people who were really great at it, like Stephen Sondheim, and then there's me. But I try. Um, I should talk a little bit about language um, because that was very important to me for those 11 or 12 years. And um, poetry. Uh, poetry uh, is, well, I, I have this definition, Emily Dickinson. Okay, there are two great definitions of poetry, and this is the second best. If I read a book and it makes me so cold, no fire can warm me, that is poetry. And to me, that is sort of like listening to Debussy's La Mer, you know, uh, you feel wet. Or uh, my friend Jack, who's in on this meeting, has this wonderful song called Thirsty Town. And if you aren't thirsty at the end of that song, well, I don't know what's wrong with you. You weren't listening. Uh, but in words themselves can become mimetic. When I would teach uh, introduction, introduction to Poetry, we use this wonderful little book by, I believe his name was Lawrence Perrin. It was called Sound and Sense. And he would give little examples of how the sound of the words, as much as the dictionary meaning, can become part of the overall meaning. And uh, one of the examples he used was this little two-line poem by Ogden Nash, and I always loved it. The old dog barks backwards over his shoulder. I can remember when he was a pup. And it sounds so simple till you think about it. The beginning of the song or the poem are what in poetic meter we call spondees. Every um, syllable is accented. The old dog barks backwards. And you think about an old dog. He's laying on a porch. He's too lazy to get up. Somebody comes up. He looks over his shoulder and waits to go, Arf, Arf, Arf. You know, they, they bark in spondies 
there's no real music in an old dog's voice or some old men's voices. Uh, and then the poet thinks back to when the dog was a puppy and suddenly I can remember when he was a pup. That triple meter, it just sounds like a little dog running through the grass. That's really beautiful. There are a lot of examples like that in great poetry where the sound itself becomes part of the meaning. Um, beaded bubbles winking at the brim. There's Keats describing an effervescent beverage or the quick sharp scratch and blue spurt of a lighted match. Quick sharp scratch. Sounds like you're striking the match and the blue spurt. And uh, I try for that in my own songwriting. Uh, I'm very, very, very rarely able to pull it off. But uh, I have one line I'm really proud of. It's whiskered whiskey whispers scratch the night. And I was just trying to get the guys in a you know, the, the seedier part of town, some old drunks exchanging words with one another in whispers, but they're scratchy whispers, and you do that. But anyway, if you don't think as a songwriter you're getting the mood across enough with the words, you turn to the music itself. And, um, and uh, I guess that's what this is all about today. And um, rather than rabbiting on any more about me, I'll turn it over to Debbie and she can play some music and then you can ask me questions or anything if you want. Okay, so I'm going to start with a couple of songs. I'll explain to you why I chose them. One is the one where I ran home and told Matt, John has written a song about you. So my boyfriend Matt is the long-suffering boyfriend. I'm often out with my girlfriends till two in the morning and he makes it clear with his um, texts of multiple question marks that get longer and longer and the where you know where are you um what and that he's waiting for me he always has to wait up i'm sure that john's song is about other types of waiting for girls girlfriends to come home um but it's it epitomizes waiting it starts out with the with the chime of the clock and the music itself you feel that agony of just waiting for somebody to come home and he does a whole catalog of things that people wait for I'm going to follow that with a song called The Ride, and I'll let John talk about that a little bit before I play these two, because it's a metaphorical ride, as I understand it. The ride, though, itself is based on something I heard the Dalai Lama say one time, which is, I thought it was great advice, relax, you're just a tourist. Well, we put things into sharp relief. We think that it's the most important thing that's ever going to happen, especially if you watch the news regularly uh it always seems like the most important thing that's ever happened is just happened tonight and uh, we don't relax and sit back and just i think that's all the song's about is just uh that we're all kind of only along for the ride don't take it quite sometimes, especially in personal matters, quite so much to heart. I guess that's all I can say about it. Three o'clock in the morning Where can you be tonight? I was all alone
So I'm going to let John move on to your death trilogy, if you can talk a little bit about Skeleton Man, Once Upon a Time, and Hamlet Redux. The first two albums, the first one's based on the Old Testament, and the second one's based on the New Testament, specifically the Book of Revelation, um, which I tried to rewrite. But if you're writing about Revelation, you have to have songs for all the horsemen, which I did. Uh, at the end, death seems to be the most important one, and um, I thought it deserved three songs. So I wrote the first song, Skeleton Man, is kind of about uh, perhaps the usefulness of death, which is uh, to make you pay attention to life, try to fill your moments with purpose um the second song it is called uh, once upon a time it's about the inevitability of death for all of us and it's kind of a weird song because uh 
and it doesn't have much hope in it until the very last line. But if you ever hear the whole song, uh, there is a little hope in the last line. <laughs> the last song is a retelling of Hamlet. And um, I think that's about the ideal death, which is uh, if you're going to die, we're all going to die. You might as well do it with style. And nobody ever died with more style than Hamlet. Uh, as he says, I'm dying in iambic pentameter. Uh, any other death is strictly amateur. Uh, you know, tr try to go out with a bang, I guess, as uh, Dylan Thomas would say. So anyway, that, that's those three songs. Thanks, John. And from the listener's point of view, Skeleton Man also sounds very Halloween-y. Um, so it's a almost caricature of death as far as the depiction of death um, from the listener's point of view. And once upon a time is poignant, you will hear, literally hear the clock winding down, the sort of like springs getting older um, for aging. And you also hear the, the um, the newness of youth in that song too. So I'll play both of those enough to hear those two features. Oh, and John, you had one more thing to mention. Uh, we'll mention it after Skeleton Man. There's a, a, a sorry, an audio effect that you did in the studio to create a new sound. And I'm gonna go through that instrumental portion. Okay, so everybody here is Skeleton Man, followed by Once Upon a Time. Hamlet Redux is a long song. We have that available as a live performance by John on our website. If you go to HoustonTuesdayMusicalClub.org while we have his program featured, or you can look up Hamlet, comma, Redux on YouTube at any time. <laughs> Thank you. 
spare time to kill time Put time in a bottle or Wear it on your wrist You can keep time while your shoes shine And syncopated for four time Put a clock on each shelf Maybe two time yourself You can pinch time or punch time Stretch time or cut time But time always wins That's the way it's always been So find time or lose time Spend time or save time Till one day you find You can buy no more time Once upon a time there was only time you could raise the sun forever Now the mainspring got rusty The gears all got dusty And sunlight makes you shiver Even sunlight makes you quiver So thanks, John. And to hear the third in the trilogy, Hamlet, you can go to our website. Um, John, the next song I wanted to do, if you want to speak about a little bit, but I think it speaks for itself, is Angel. I think we need a little uh, lightness mm -hmm. after talking about death. And this is one of the few I wanted to play all the way through because it's really a short story. Um, I see it as the characters in a small bar dive out in the boondocks somewhere, and the characters are fantastically depicted in this song. Those first two albums, I really couldn't have done with uh, how really great people around me. And uh, I want to mention a few of them. Sean Kelly, he was playing the bass on uh, The Ride is just me, but uh, my last album is just me and an acoustic guitar because I got so much grief from the folk community about uh, production. But those first two albums, uh, Sean was my wingman, and he was the basis for the Boulder Symphony, and a really good musician. Julia Hayes was the violinist, and he's also a really accomplished musician. And, and of course, Everett, who's on this call, I couldn't have done a lot of this stuff without Everett. And I want to talk about In Skeleton, man. I was trying to get a kind of tribal sound on the drums. And the guy playing the snare is actually using a, a steel garbage can for the snare drum. It's being played with split bamboo poles. But we still couldn't get it, and Everett came up with the idea of, instead of individually miking drums, using overheads to give it more air. But one thing you can also do in the studio that happens at the end of that, that you can't do... I don't think as easily in an orchestra unless you can have two people sit, one sit in another's lap. When you mix and you're talking about panning, you can put two instruments in the same spot and they sort of become one instrument. And so on that song, you have a, in the break, a harmonica and a jaw harp mixed in the same spot. And if you ever listen to it closely, it'll sound like it's just one instrument some weird instrument maybe you've never heard. Um, now we go to An Angel. This song is based on a real bar. I like to write bar songs. Um, there aren't very many real bars left in the world. They're all chrome and sports channels going on, but this was an authentic bar. Um, and the characters are, are mostly real people. Well, they're all real people, but uh, one one character who appears in the song is actually another folk singer, a guy named Jack Nose, named Chuck Brodsky. Um, but one night I noticed that, uh, and this is true of all real bars, there's some woman in there who's usually a little underweight and been in too many tanning salons and has a tattoo of a rose usually on her shoulder or something. And 
come hell or high water, when she gets drunk enough, she will treat the entire bar to an acapella version of me and Bobby McGee. That's kind of what this song's about. There's a funny little bar off of Colfax Street With a gimpy bartender who looks half asleep He's surly, he smells, and he calls himself Fred Got a tie-dye do-rap on his old ball head The pool table teaches you that angles are fickle The top looks and smells like an old dill pickle Cues are all warped and the nine balls cracked. When it eats up your quarter, Fred won't give it back. Miss Pac-Man's in the corner with an ancient jukebox full of Aerosmith, BGs, and ZZ Top. And Marines raise a flag over Iwo Jima near the air hockey table with emphysema. And they always cry timber at every last call When Angel gets top-heavy from alcohol Listing and listing for the starboard She will capsize and sink to the floor But she will resurface as pretty as you please And there on her knees she sing me and Bobby McGee Dolores has a face like a friendly chipmunk. She calls everybody baby even when she ain't drunk. She's large and maternal and bright floral prints, brown cigarettes and Altoid mints. And Buddy Aquino is a tiny Filipino. He runs off to Reno so he can play Kino. In love with Dolores, though he won't let on. Snapping her picture with his cellular phone And Rick drives a tow truck and he brings his own cue stick And he thinks he's real witty, but he's really a prick With his buddy Lester, the sheep molester Two bad, bad boys in polyester and they always cry timber at every last call When Angel gets top-heavy from alcohol Listing and listing for the starboard Or oh, she will capsize, sink to the floor But she will resurface just pretty as you please And there on her knees she'll sing me and Bobby McGee Puts all her money in the great divide And you can buy her beer and she'll bum cigarettes But she won't take you riding in her new Corvette And Chuck thinks that baseball is better than sex He's either praising the Phillies or he's cursing his ex He's all shortstops, pitch outs, and suicide slides The danger's attending the male order bride Maggie was a dancer and a sultry fox Till diabetes ate a leg and now she talks with a box And she breathes with a tube and she farts with a plum. Don't smoke next to her and that oxygen mom And they always cry timber at every last call When Angel gets top heavy from alcohol Listing and listing for the starboard Or oh, she will capsize, sink to the floor And hell could freeze and tigers eat peas She'd get to her knees and sing me and Bobby McGee 
Now be your glass half empty, your glass half full. In Detroit or Austin or Istanbul, like camels cross deserts for a dirty well, we drunk seek salvation in the middle of hell. So where the Naga hides duct taped and the Formica's all chipped, the linoleum stained and the toilets all drip. There's a tall, skinny waitress with no upper lip. Her name is Angel. Don't forget her tip. I really wanted to play the last four, the whole last four uh, tracks of of uh, Dreams of the Lost Tribe, which are superb. I don't think we'll be able to get to it. I consider two of them absolute musts. So, but John, I'd like to at least talk a little bit about Whippa Will. And the ones I'm gonna have to skip, one of them is my favorite songs of all time, which is the When the Moon Comes Out to Play. And the reason I love it is that it's acts, it has a wonderful ostinato underneath it. And it's a slow burn of increasing emotion about someone who's lying awake all night in a hot summer night. You hear the hot summer night and, um, and the agony of the lovers gone away and, the, and being up all night because he talks about the peeping over the wet from the east and then sailing on to the west. So you see this man lying in bed uh, waiting for his lover. That's preceded by another depiction of summer called Whippoorwill. And I won't have time to play it, but John has a great story about the recorder player who, um, who he asked to uh, become the whippoorwill. And he does a great job, but apparently not after some snafus. John? Uh, well, Bill Hill. I don't think he's with us any longer, but he was an older African-American gentleman who was just a real gem. I liked him a lot. And he would play little jazz things on the recorder, which uh, that in and of itself got my got my attention but i knew this song i'd written about a whippoorwill i thought well that would be just perfect in this song because the recorder could kind of catch the sound of the whippoorwill but i said well i know bill's even less of a musician than me and he doesn't really know notes and stuff but he played summertime and so i deliberately structured the break of the song to be the chords in summertime. And uh, nonetheless, that didn't work. For some reason, I would tell him, only play the notes you play in the song Summertime. And he kept, I don't know, uh, I guess it was like a, it should have been in, in the key of C. He kept managing to throw a C sharp in there or something every time we would try to get him to improvise something. So as a consequence on the album, the song's about two verses shorter than it originally was. But uh, we had a lot of fun with him. And then in, uh, he was complaining and Everett managed to catch a little bit of his complaining. And we put that in another song in the middle of it. <laughs> Just him complaining about, I want to know the song. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's, that's my 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 story on Whippoorwill. And uh, so which two are we going to listen to? So I'd like to play Cajun Flood followed by Lullaby for Ruth, uh, just to show that John can write achingly beautiful music. I believe the lullaby he ends this album with may be the best lullaby I've heard, even better than Brahms. It's the most beautiful mm -hmm. lullaby I've heard, written for his eight-year-old daughter, who's now your grandpa now, right? Um, yeah. Who's now grown, has had a baby. Um, and that's preceded by Cajun Flood. And Cajun Flood, I understand John was written three years before Katrina. Is that the case? Yes. Um, yeah. So when, when I went to um, John's first house concerts after Katrina, the audience would beg him to play Cajun Flood. It's also my favorite song. Uh, and it definitely illustrates our theme today of the music changing with the narrative. Um, but maybe, John, you can explain why you wrote the song. I just want to let you know you're vindicated because I saw an independent lens on PBS where the Cajun, uh, Cajun people are talking about their ability to brush off great tragedy, hurricanes, and all that, and go back to their singing and dancing. 
which I remember you're telling the audience was exactly what you had in mind. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid the reasons I wrote Cajun Flood are very pedestrian. I had just bought something called a banjo lin, which is a mandolin with a banjo body. And I didn't know how to play mandolin. So I knew I'd, the easiest way would be for me to make up something on the mandolin, turn it into a song so I'd play the mandolin. And so that's the impetus behind writing it. But that whole first album is the sort of overlying metaphor is water. And um, one of the earliest songs talks about um, a soft rain. And it's preceded by this um, little line in French, uh, s'il pleut tous les jours, je m'en fous, je m'en fous, which basically means if it rains every day, I don't care, I don't care. Uh, that's bodlerizing it a bit, uh, so you don't have to cut stuff. And that's about all I got to say. Uh, I hope you like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, your audience. So I love this song. We'll end with Cajun Flood and um, and lullaby for Ruth. And uh, I just want to mention the Cajun flood, you hear everything. You hear the, the music changes, you hear the flood waters rise, you hear them float into the gulf. And if you miss the first few spoken words, they are the rains came and the levee broke and the Cajun started in to float. Is that correct, John? Um, and then the later Cajun on, started in to yeah, float. Yeah. right. So later on, he mentions that it's on the back of a northern gale. This is exactly Katrina. Well, the rains came and the levee broke and all the Cajuns started in the flood. Float to the left and they float to the right and they float down the river and clean out of sight. Well, they float with the pipes and they float with the fiddles and they float kind of quick when they float in the middle. Say, move your alligator, float by now, we float back later. Cypress trees, Pierre called sweet Louise. Shari said, Dibi Dosu, we be in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the thunder rumbled in the air, Louise cried to her Pierre. Pass wine and try to hurry, all this water's made me thirsty. What's a Lorraine new Cajun man? Been knee deep since I could stand Brought up here on the boggy land What's a little more rain to occasion? But a lightning flash and rain poured down And still it floated southward bound Underneath the oil derricks, flood waters black as sticks. Pass the piers and pass the jetties, frozen spray like white confetti. On the back of a northern gale into an angry ocean sail. What's a little rain to Cajun man? I've been knee deep since I could stand. Grown up here on the boggy land What's a little more rain to a kitchen? And the waves rose higher Than the tops of a tall pine tree And the captains on their boats was crying near my God to thee And the people on the shore They said a prayer for the poor Cajun ghost The wind died down And the sun came out And the Cajuns gave a 
mighty shout. They said, hey, hey, what a lovely day, floating out chair where the mermaids play. So they float on down to Yucatan, they had a jamboree in the snow white sand. On a strip boat called Anne Marie, they hitched a ride like they were What's a rain occasion, man? Been knee deep since I could stand. Growing up here on the Bali land. What's a little more?
sand slowly sifting into your eyes I see you drifting drift away drift away but drift back to me John, thank you very much for your beautiful music. You have very rich and wonderful world inside yourself. And you kind of open uh, your mind, uh, my mind. And uh, it's so inventive. It's so bright and different. And I really enjoy it. Thank oh, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm a little, that last song always gets to me a little bit. So, uh, a little more emotional than I should be, but um, I'm so glad you liked it. Um, and thanks to all of you for listening in. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know most of you are serious musicians, and I don't have the vocabulary to really explain some of the stuff, uh, which you probably already know. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for, for listening. John, have you? You're such a poet in your music. Have you written uh, books of poetry? Oh no, I don't think I'm a poet uh, at all. Uh, I've I've read a lot of poetry. I know sometimes we songwriters get. Uh, they'll say so and so was a real poet, and I. I, I sometimes I admit I I do hear like in the lyrics of Leonard Cohen or, or a, a very small handful of what I really consider poetry, but um, uh, I think poetry is, is a lot harder on one level because you have to infuse so much meaning. If the meaning just doesn't ray out of something, I'm not sure it qualifies. But on the other hand, songwriting is a lot harder because you don't usually have to sing poetry. So I think it's like a, an equal trait, but I'm glad you like the lyric. And thank you I so did. much. For thank you. I found it very poetic. Oh, you're so awfully kind. I thank you for saying it. Three of my favorite songwriters are Randy Newman and Joni Mitchell and um, Tom Waits. And uh, I really can't do anything like Joni does. But those two, Randy Newman and Joni Mitchell, represent for me what in poetry Shakespeare and Shelley represent. Uh, Robert Browning has a very famous essay where he talks about Shakespeare being the perfect objective poet, which is you can look at most Shakespeare and never find Shakespeare. You can find a lot of really, really amazing characters Falstaff and King Lear and Hamlet and on and on, but it's very hard to find Shakespeare. He's always speaking through a third person. Shelley, on the other hand, you can't read a single Shelley poem without it's Shelley. It's Shelley talking about himself. And uh, Randy Newman is almost always writing from a third person perspective. His, his songs are, um, and it's, a shame because a lot of times the listener thinks, um, oh, every songwriter is writing from his or her own perspective. And poor old Randy got in a lot of trouble for short people, which is really just a song about the stupidity of prejudice. And uh, they thought he was making fun of short people, but Randy's not very tall himself. Joni, on the other hand, just about every Joni Mitchell song you ever hear will be about Joni Mitchell. She's a very subjective writer. I um, I generally move more toward Randy's style. I like to write from other points of view. Um, but thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the lyrics. I did. 
Don, that was just gorgeous. Um, I loved uh, you're also bringing Debussy into the mix because he's one of my favorites. Um, speaking of blasts from the past, great, great um, um, people from the past, the Tuesday Musical Club, which was in um, existence for over a hundred years, would have an artist concert or two every single year highlighting some of the most famous up and coming. I mean, some of them weren't famous when, when we um, would present them, but they became very famous. And so you're now gonna hear June Anderson, the uh, dramatic coloratura. She sang uh, with the Tuesday Musical Club or sang for the Tuesday Musical Club when she was about 26 years old in 1979. And now you'll hear her sing Candide with the Leonard Bernstein conducting. Purchased 
as they were, had such an awful cost. Bracelets, lavaliers, can they dry my tears? Can they blind my eyes to shame? Can the brightest brooch shield me from reproach? Can the purest diamond purify my name? And yet to most these trinkets are endearing. <laughs> I'm oh so glad my summer is a star. <laughs> I rob like a twin to not it here. <laughs> if I'm not pure, at least my jewels are. Fino, fino. I'll take that diamond necklace and show my noble So that's how uh, Bernstein and Voltaire see uh, life. Do you know the story of Voltaire uh, when he played, when he went to the orgy? No, please. Well, Voltaire was friends with the um, Archbishop of Paris and uh, they had sort of a love-hate relationship and at 70, Voltaire got invited to an orgy and the archbishop heard about it and gave him great grief. He says, you're not going. And he said, oh yeah, I am, you am. And anyway, Voltaire went out, went to the orgy and uh, a few days later, they were back together. And the old archbishop says, well, I guess you went to that sump of sin. And Voltaire said, well, yes, I did as a matter of fact. And he says, uh, I guess you enjoyed yourself. And he says, I had a great time. And he says, I guess you'll be going back. Voltaire looked at him shocked and said, Monsieur, once a philosopher, twice a pervert. Thanks. I did not know the Voltaire story. I know, I know the Candide. I've read it, but I did not know the man. So thanks so much. Um, so, I, Galena, we have one of your students on. Would you like to talk about him a little bit? I want to introduce the, um, my student, Brian Wunk, and uh, he is not as sophisticated musician as all performers today. <laughs> he is only 15. And uh, um, uh, he got a second place in the intermediate uh, division of um, international competition in New York this year. And as a result, he will play in Carnegie Hall. And actually, it's, uh, uh, he's my student since fourth grade. And actually, it's his first big success. Uh, he worked very hard and long, but I think he did good result. Uh, then uh, he will play Etude uh, Tableau Opus uh, 39, uh, number five by Sergei Rachmaninov who composed this song when he was 44 years old.
Thanks so much, Galena. He's really marvelous. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see if, um, I know Alicia has a deadline. Alicia, are you here? Can you introduce your music in person? So we have flutist Alicia Harris here. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, I wasn't expecting to uh, speak live. I don't do that very well. I apologize. Um, but I heard this piece um, played by uh, James Galway, our favorite flutist there, and I fell in love with it. And um, I worked on the piece and um, I didn't feel very confident with it when I went to Switzerland to the James Galway uh, school. Um, I played for the master class there. I had prepared a different piece and um, at the last minute changed it <laughs> to this one. And um, there wasn't enough time, so I played two movements of it, but not these two that I played for you. Um, so I'm finishing up with playing the other two movements. Um, number three is uh, Romance and uh, four is Final. The composer is Charles Marie Vieter. It's called Vieter Suite for Flute and Piano, Opus 34. Uh, Vieter was um, a very famous composer of organ symphonies. He was also a conductor and a teacher. And um, he did write some other pieces, um, uh, only one for flute and piano and then a flute um, with a trio. So I hope you really enjoy it. Um, the, the romance piece is just absolutely delightful. I play it a lot slower than most people do. So I hope you enjoy it.
So thanks, Alicia. That's a fantastic piece. So thanks for introducing us to that. I didn't know it. I only know Vidor as an organ composer, but it sounds like he's composed for quite a few other instruments. Beautiful romantic piece. So thank you very much. We have, a, I know this is a long song today, but we have one more performer, Steve McMillan. Let me see if you're still here. Um, I just uh, dashed off a couple of things last night in the lobby of the post office as I was dropping a few things off, I thought, well, this is a good silent place with uh, with hard surfaces, so I'll give it a try. So there it is.
well, we certainly went out with a, a bang uh, between John's poetry and his music and, and our own performers and, and Galena's student. This has been uh, a, just a fabulous time today. And thank you all for coming.